Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brand Your Practice podcast, where you get to learn about branding, marketing, marketing, and scaling your private practice. I'm Brent Stutzman, the owner of Brand Your Practice, and today we're going to be talking about how to transition a group practice to 100% private pay. That's right, how to transition a group practice that was primarily leaning on insurance to 100% private pay. And to help me do that is Megan Humphreys. She is the owner and founder of Thrive Couples Counseling here in Hinsdale, Illinois, just right outside of Chicago. Welcome to the show, Megan. Thank you. I'm glad to be here today. All right. So we're going to be talking and getting into the numbers. So if you stay to the end, we're going to do a deep dive into the numbers of switching to 100% private pay. Um, so please stay to the end if you're interested in those numbers, because a lot of, you know, a lot of podcasts that I've listened to, they usually don't dive into the numbers. They just talk about it. So we want to give the listeners some data they can go uh, and hopefully get the confidence to do it themselves. But before we dive in, I'd love for us or I love for our listeners to kind of know how we are connected. And so I'm just going to share a little background, then you can chime in and fill in some of the um, the details. Sound good? Sure. All right. So in 2019, in April, right around my birthday, uh, my wife, Susan, and I spoke at the Illinois Affiliation of Marriage and Family Therapists, and we did a little breakout session on uh, how to start your private practice, how to grow your private practice, that type of thing. And you were there and you reached out to me. So I'd love to have a conversation because I'm interested in doing this thing, uh, starting my own practice. And so later that summer in 2019, you became part of the Branger Practice family, I guess. I don't know how to say that. You became, you know, did the partnership plan. And why don't you jump in? Because at the time, uh, you were working for your dad and he was getting ready to retire. Yeah. Um, when I attended your um, workshop at the conference, um, I had been, yeah, just kind of knowing that his retirement was on the horizon and we were, um, you know, talking about a, a bunch of different ideas about kind of where to go from there. Um, and I thought that starting my own practice and kind of starting fresh would be kind of exciting, but it was incredibly overwhelming. Um, and uh, I think I remember walking up to you after the workshop and, you know, playing the like, but where, where do you work? And we realized that I worked literally across the street from you. <laughs> um, and so that was like, oh, that, this feels like so convenient. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, meeting and then, um, yeah, getting started, uh, having some hand holding with that beginning, opening up the practice. Um, there were so many different things that, uh, needed to be done that I can't even imagine, uh, just sort of fumbling along and navigating on my own. Um, but it was, yeah, at the end, end of the summer, beginning of that fall that, um, you know, you helped me with, uh, encouraged me to pick a name. That was one of the most challenging things ever. And then, um, you know, just sort of beginning the branding with creating a logo even. Yeah. And I remember we were talking, I was like, you know, I think I might've mentioned private pay early on. Like, would you like to do this? Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, yeah, I would love to, but at your dad's practice, it was like all insurances. And then when we started Thrive Couples, there was two things. You're like, all right, well, let's just do one insurance. Like the big insurance in town, which is Blue Cross Blue Shield, like they reimburse the best. So let's just, let's just do that and the rest can be cash pay. But I also said we needed to niche down, right? And so that yeah. was a big thing too. It's like, we're just going to do relationships, couples, marriages. That's all we're going to focus on. Mm -hmm. And... um Boy, did that blow up like that was crazy. It, you started to grow pretty quick and you had it a hire really quick. And now mm -hmm. you have a team of four clinicians where, so we're just a couple years into it, two and a half, two years, three mm -hmm. years. Like now you have four clinicians. You had to just move into a bigger office. You're looking to hire again. So, um, those were some big things that happened, but now the biggest thing that happened was switching to hundred percent private pay and just, for context, we just did some numbers. And in 2021, insurance was 65% of the revenue. That's reinsurance reimbursement. That doesn't include the co-pays. So that percentage could be even higher. Um, so that's to kind of give you some context. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, 
to what I'm calling the three steps to prepare to tra- prepare your practice to transition to 100% private pay. And this is where I actually was most impressed with you, Megan, because you were so thoughtful about this. Um, we're going to talk about these three things. One was you were, you know, you had to talk to Blue Cross Blue Shield, so preparing them to leave Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, you had to prepare your clients for this transition. And then you had to prepare your team for the transition. So I'd love for you to kind of start with (laughs) your experience about preparing to leave Blue Cross Blue Shield and uh, getting off their panel. Yeah, that uh, you think it's hard to get on the panel. It's a totally different story getting (laughs) off of the panel. Um, In fact, my father who retired two, is it two years ago now, might still technically be on the panel because he just couldn't figure out how to get off of it. Um, I think that because it's such a big chore to get paneled, I imagine that a lot of practice owners get stuck in, oh my gosh, this is going to be really hard too. Um, Or they might even tell themselves, it's going to be super easy. You just send a letter and then they take you off, right? Um, because that was the requirement, right? You had a, that, hand, a handwritten right. letter. <laughs> that's right. I sent it certified mail. I made sure that it was picked up from their P.O. box. All of those things. Um, I, I probably, if I had it to do over again, would have sent it a full month before hitting that 90 days so that I had that month to make sure it was picked up and to then... Mm-hmm attempt to contact somebody to confirm that they'd received it and that they were going to honor my request to uh, terminate my contract. But there's Um, no phone number. I mean, I remember you're like, I've tried every way to get a hold of these people. And there was, it was like a black hole. And then what did you do? You did something (laughs) creative (laughs) to get their attention. Um, Yeah. After having been on hold, I would say, a conservative number would be 10 hours and being passed around because the benefits side thought I needed to talk to the claims department. The claims are like, absolutely not. You need to talk to so-and-so and they'd pass me around. So I was so frustrated and the clock was ticking. Originally I had planned to start this year, 2022 private pay because everybody's um, deductibles restart. And so I thought that it would be the perfect timing to kind of encourage people to kind of hang around and give this new way of services being paid for and all of that to kind of adjust to that. Um, But I sent my letters, my letter in at the very beginning of October or the end of September so that that was, you know, three months out. And um, I hadn't heard anything And we were in like the middle of November. So I went on to Blue Cross's website and found their, um, what is it called? Now I can't remember the name. I wrote it down, but their like provider customer support or something. That's not quite the right word, but um, so they have like, yeah, contact people for different regions of the state and, um, we're part of Metro Chicago, that p- portion. And I imagine that in that one section of this state, there are quite a few therapists and practices. And so I had sent one or two emails and heard nothing. So I went rogue and emailed every single region of Illinois and <laughs> said, I need somebody to contact me to confirm Uh, that you've received my termination, you know, I need to notify clients and the timeline was supposed to be in only a few more weeks, but that's unethical and it's unprofessional for me to just say, oh, well, since Blue Cross didn't get back to me, you know, we're going to terminate our contract with them in four weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I had to push back once I finally, when I sent all of those emails, it was maybe within a week that I heard from somebody. Um, And then we were able to kind of discuss all of that. And I then adjusted out my, the effective date of the termination of the contract to March 1st. 
Yeah, from yeah. So you had to push it back from January one because, I mean, what that does for you though as a practice owner is like your ment your mentality is like we're going to do this. You're telling your team we're going to do this. We're going to do this. This is the dates, and then you had to push it back three months. And well, that's just the nature of that, right? <laughs> we were in a holding pattern for quite a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's jump over to uh, number two, preparing your clients for the transition. So I'd love for sure. you to kind of share how you how you did that, because that's a big deal, too. Yeah. Um, with clients, I once I had confirmation, I did not want to do it before I knew because I uh, knew that Blue Cross was on board with this. Um, I didn't want to send a letter to my clients. So what I did was um, I had spoken with my team ahead of time. I let them know the date that I sent a letter. Um, and the letter that I sent to the clients, um, I tried to be pretty straightforward and brief. I want to let you know about some changes that are coming up. Um, and I mentioned two things, one that our status as in-network providers was going to change and that we would begin operating as a direct pay practice is mm -hmm. how I framed it, um, to try and help all of the clients get some understanding of what paying for services was going to look like in the future. Um, I was very explicit to also say, this does not mean that your treatment has to end, um, that I had created a guide that they could follow step-by-step -step to verify their out-of-network benefits. Um, and then I, you know, thank, I usually end a lot of things with, thank you for entrusting us with your care. And it's a privilege mm -hmm. to um, get to work with you, uh, you know, journey with you through trying to accomplish your goals, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that letter went out and once I put it in the mail, I let all my clinicians know that within the next, you know, week or so, their clients would be receiving this. And so we kind of held back for four or five days and then um, everybody was then to follow up with their clients as they saw them to say, you know, a letter was sent. Did you receive it? you know, what questions do you have and things like that so that then there could be a more personal conversation about it um, mm -hmm. as it certainly impacted clients differently. Um, but that's, yeah, I guess that was kind of where we started with notifying clients. Mm -hmm. And then you also had, uh, well, then we, we updated the website. We actually created a video around mm -hmm. it to put on the kind of the insurance page so that you they could read it, but also, in, you know, see you explaining some of the reasons why. And then um, then you had an in-person conversation. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So we, um, like I said, a week maybe after we finished or after I had sent out the letters, um, I had talked with my team and also with my clients myself to just kind of inquire if they'd received it. Of course, every once in a while you end up with a client who had not received it. So right. that was news to them. Um, and so everybody was, uh, you know, equipped with kind of the script, I guess. Like um, talking points. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. to say, like, like I said, like I wanted to make it very clear that there were sort of two changes happening at the same time. And also to make it very clear that they did have some options that it didn't mean your treatment has to end right now, which I know if I was on the receiving end, I might think, Oh, you're changing the way I do this. And so that means I can't continue my treatment here. So, um, so we did, you know, wanted to make sure you received it. If not, here's the update. And then I really just opened it to clients with, do you have any questions um, that you want to ask me? I encouraged my staff to answer questions as best they could, but if they couldn't, to encourage clients, their clients to reach out to me. Um, and I definitely let them say like something along the lines of like, this was not my decision. It was Megan's decision. Um, not, that's kind of unprofessional, I suppose, but yeah, like yeah. something to that. Uh, degree of 
uh, you know, if you're upset, you can talk to Megan. Right. This um, was the practice owners. This is a practice wide right. decision. Um, right. And then just kind of like send them, you know, cause you want to, you say protect, but you kind of want to have their back and be like, Hey, mm -hmm. if this is a big issue for some people. Please talk to Megan. She's more than willing to, you know, did you actually have anyone do that out of all, I mean, all the clients that you guys have? At the time, I don't think so. I, I certainly heard from a few of, of uh, my clinicians that some people were not happy um, or they were very confused. Mm -hmm. And I just reiterated, please let them know that I'd be happy to answer questions mm -hmm. or explain more in depth about the reasoning for this decision all while trying not to sound defensive or anything, right? This is a decision that I'm making for this business. Um, I, as time went on, especially cause we had that weird, like it's the end of the year. Now we have just these two months. That was kind of a weird time. And yeah, navigating some of that was a little tricky, but, um, as we transit transitioned, there were maybe one or two of all of our clients that were being seen by other clinicians that, um, that I ended up speaking to for, you know, different reasons, but nobody directly came to me and said, I cannot believe you. How dare you do this? And, you know, was just fuming. Yeah. 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 So it was kind of, it was sort of quiet, you know, mm -hmm. it was kind of quiet. So that's good. I mean, that's also a testament to you doing a good job preparing and explaining. I mean, there's always going to be confusion, but it wasn't like this massive blowback <laughs> or anything like that. Um, Okay, so let's go to the third one because I thought this was really interesting because a lot of this, you, I mean, you you could testify for even for yourself. A lot of this, I remember working with you on, was like mindset because this is just <laughs> a huge, <laughs> a huge mindset for the practice owners, but also for your team in which, yeah. you know, a lot of people will go private pay just as a solo practitioner, but to do it on a, a, a team level takes a little bit more. So I would love for you to kind of share the conversations that you were having, like how you were processing it with your team and things like that. Cause you did a lot of, there was a lot of lead up time getting, getting your team on board. So I, I know listeners are just really curious about <laughs> <laughs> like the things that you kind of had to work through together. Yeah. So I would say I'm pretty confident this is how it went, but I, I'm not 100% sure. I'm pretty confident that when I was interviewing these employees, it was something that I mentioned, maybe somewhat casually, that at some point I wanted to transition to the practice to being private pay. Um, I imagine being interviewed that that's not something that you're going to like grab a hold of and like really chew on all that much. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it was part of my bigger picture. I know you mentioned um, kind of the getting started part where I was just a little too nervous to um, open my practice and just be private pay, even though you encouraged me time and again, I just could not, it felt like just too scary. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did the long prep with my employees because I did try to mention that when I was bringing them on, that it was something that I hoped to do in the future. Um, so then when I had finally decided like, it's time to do this, um, let's put a date to it and all of that. I let each of them know individually. I meet with all of my clinicians, um, about once a week. And so, um, and then we meet together as a group. So I first started by sharing this news with them each individually, um, asking them if they had any questions. I really, it was quite similar to telling our clients hmm. that we're going to, you know, do this change. Um, and so, you know, at first there weren't a lot of questions um, beyond like when and how much are we going to charge and things like that. Some of the logistics, um, I don't think the fear and emotional component set in at that time. Um, and then of course, because I would imagine I told them in August or September, maybe, um, 
you know, like, okay, and then I'm going to write the letter. And then, yeah, so things got pushed out. So we talked about it for a long time and prepped for it for a long time. But the initial response was um, neutral um, with a little bit of fear, right? Everybody was kind of like, are we going to lose all of our clients, right? Because about 80% of our practice was uh, insurance-based mm-hmm. Blue Cross Blue Shield clients. So um, there was a lot of fear around that. Um, and it grew and grew as we got closer and closer to March 1st. <laughs> I remember, yeah, it was being pretty palpable. Like, and I remember, um, you know, we'll get into the numbers in just a minute, but I remember March being like, you know, I could tell like physically, like this just took a huge toll on you. Like I just saw like, you're like, oh, like you're, you're kind of your, your joyful disposition <laughs> was it there. And I was like, oh, okay. I just need to go. We just need to go slow. I can't like throw like, a, like, Hey, let's do this type of marketing or anything like that. Like we just need to let it sit. And it, yeah. it was sort of like, um, I don't know if it's like a calm before the storm. Cause there really, I don't know. It, there wasn't really a storm, but it's it felt like, more like a panic. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> Everybody panicked. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I suppose I could maybe ask them now that I interacted with everybody in a confident manner. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I truly, when I thought about it, I was not panicked, but of course, being the one who's steering the ship, Mm -hmm. when you have all of the people working for you saying, all of my clients are telling me that they're not going to come back and I'm going to lose all of my income and I can't do that. And right. And really, really worried, which is understandable. There's a reason that I didn't do it before now anyway, because of the same fear. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I reassured them and, and all of that, but you can't guarantee anything either. So it was really hard, um, to say, trust me, I, I know what I'm doing and I know who I'm relying on that knows what they're doing when I don't know what I'm doing, but I couldn't guarantee that it was going to turn out perfectly well for everybody. So it was, um, it was hard. I do remember trying very hard, um, in like those first two months of the year. Right. So it was like, as soon as we hit January, things just started to, everybody got a little nervous and it kind of grew till we got to March 1st or probably through some of March even. Mm -hmm. Um, But I tried to remind myself that I've been working in private practice for gosh, at least 11 years now. And there would be times where if I had too many people cancel in one week, I would, you know, catastrophize and be worried that I wouldn't be able to provide for my family or any of those things. And the reality is, while there were certainly some months that were kind of slim, it, it was okay. And more people called and, and Mm -hmm. we got new clients or any of those things. And you really do, I think in this field in general, have to practice like looking further down the road or like looking at the big picture. Um, Certainly being fiscally responsible and all of those things are important too, but Mm -hmm. Um, I think that whenever I could grab hold of that thought, um, like this is kind of how our business goes anyway, right? We have seasons where you are seeing far too many clients because there are surges at different points in the year where we tend to get more calls just because, um, and then there are months, uh, that are really quiet and, it's easy to get in your head about the fact that like all of your income is going to be gone and um, to catastrophize a little bit. So, yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to have you share in just a second on the, on some of the mindset uh, or uh, some of the just reasons why you wanted to get off. Because for me, uh, you said fiscal responsibility for me, you know, insurance companies dictate how much you're worth or how much your time is worth. Mm. And that's not exactly always what the market would like. And so there's two things is there's two levers you can pull. And I say this all the time. If you want to increase your revenue, you can see more clients and you can see your, you can raise your rates. So those are two levers. When you, when you are beholden to insurance contracts and they determine you can't raise your rates because just not the contract that you won't get paid. You have to, you will get paid according to the contract. So you have to pull the lever to see more clients, which often leads to burnout. And um, 
Uh, it, this is very true for a lot of private practice, but also agencies where you have to see like 30, 40 clients. So it's, it's, it's an amazing amount of burnout that people will have, but that's the name of the game. You just got to push through. That's why a lot of doctor's office visits. It's just like, you just got to move them in, move them out, move them in, move them out. And you just don't feel like you're being cared for um, yeah. from the other end. So that's why I was like, hmm, you know, the other thing is you built a pretty powerful brand in the area. Like, I mean, you really grew quickly. And so, and you also, part of building a brand is you have great service. So you provide great service to your clients. Um, so for me, I guess from like operations, financial side, it makes more sense to, to go private pay. It takes a little longer to grow a practice. But I'm curious before we go into our sponsor break, if you could just share what was kind of the main struggle that you had with insurance companies um, to kind of that kind of pushed you over like, all right, now mm. is the time. Well, um, I was trying to recall 11 years ago when I joined private practice, what the rate was that Blue Cross would pay for an hour session with a client. And I can't quite remember, but I want to say it was no more than $3 less than they're paying right now. I mean, maybe even less than that. It might've been $2 Whoa. over 11 years. So, um, that was like a huge factor, right? So your, your rate is throttled, um, by your agreement, right? But you also mm -hmm. get sort of a, a funneling of potential clients because of that, which is the whole point of it. Right. The um, network effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I found, especially as I began adding, I began adding more and more clinicians that my work hours spent dealing with insurance issues grew exponentially with every new uh, clinician that I hired. So it's sitting on the phone to the insurance company for hours sometimes. Yeah, you can get other work done while you're waiting, but you're kind of stuck to the, the phone and all of that. <laughs> um, I had to contact clients um, of other clinicians or my own because the insurance company does not pay you the day that you see the client. There's a delay. And so there were times where the insurance company would pay out for like a month's worth of sessions. And if the client was in their deductible, they would then owe several hundred dollars. And while we do require clients keep a credit card on file, that's, it's not doable for people sometimes to be like, oh, sure. Yeah. Just charge $500 on my credit card and all at once. And so there was a lot of kind of managing the, you know, how can we get this taken care of? Um, but but there's this delay, um, which makes it really hard to have it all be seamless. So there was a lot of time spent doing that on top of keeping track of which money coming in was collected for which clinician, um, which will forever be some of the work. But it was hours, easily, easily 20 hours a week. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, you, you even had like simple practice to kind of help you with some of that stuff. And this is another thing is like, when you have that much insurance coming in, there's a lot of practices that have to hire billers. And so you're already getting a lower rate, the mm -hmm. insurance rate, and you're having to probably pay somebody else unless you're doing it. So that's your own time. And so I, I just remember like, when I was talking to you, you're like, I'm done. I'm ready yeah. to, I mean, it was like a, the big moment to push you over the edge to be like, all right, we're going to do private pay. So, um, so let's, let me take a, here's a little, uh, sponsor break here and then we'll join, uh, we'll jump back in on kind of the launch and some dig into some of the numbers. Cause I'm sure people would like to know about that. So before I go on, uh, I want to remind the listener about a free resource you can take advantage of today. You know, there's a lot of mental health professionals who want to start their own private practice or group practice, but they don't know where to begin. So I put together a free ultimate launch checklist. It's a checklist that I use to grow over 10 private practices already. And I break it down to the three main sections and they're like phases. The first phase are about the items of laying the foundation for your practice. Things like sketch out a business plan and get incorporated, setting up your business bank accounts, just getting a name. Phase two is focused on the marketing. You create a logo, set up a Google business profile, and then even eventually launching your website. 
And then phase three focuses on the items you do right before you launch, really. It's, you know, making sure you have your EHR in place, uh, creating a homepage video, maybe suggestions on uh, what type of copier fax machine you should have for your office. It's a very detailed launch checklist and it's easy to follow. And there are links to dozens of how-to videos that I've created over the years to help you along the way. So just go to brandyourpractice.com slash checklist. That's brandyourpractice.com slash checklist. Look, every airline pilot follows a pre-launch checklist. Every astronaut follows the launch checklist before going into space. So if you're going to launch your website, download the free launch checklist today at brandyourpractice.com slash checklist. All right, here we go. Let's dive into some of the numbers here. So... Uh, we're two months in to being 100% private pay. So these are preliminary numbers. Uh, the data isn't exactly per, like per, uh, perfect, but although, Megan, when we do have the practice owners retreat, I would love for you to do a breakout session <laughs> on <laughs> this, just kind of walking through, because I think I think so many people are interested in this. This is where they, you know, this is where they want to go. This is where they want to be because um, they're just tired of insurance. Most of them are. So, okay, so I have some notes here. Um, how many clients, so we were talking about how many common questions would I know would be how many clients did you lose because of private pay? Um, and I have some notes here. Um, you know, when we were going to private pay, you were saying some were transitioning out already, right? Their, their time sure. of getting help was, was coming to a close. Um, and so, but clients that you lost directly, uh, because of private pay, here are some numbers that you shared with me. So in January, you lost 11. This is January of this year. You lost 11 clients. The practice did. In February, right before the launch in, in March, where the private pay was fully kicking in, what you lost 28, which is, right. you know, that was a big one. That's probably yeah. where your clinicians are like, I feel like everyone's leaving me. And then March so far in, in March, 2022, you've lost 12. Um, which could also just be the normal attrition of some people too, just the cycling. I don't know. We didn't go back to see how many clients lost and throughout 2021, but, uh, but we don't have any April's numbers. Um, oh anything you want to say with that? Mm -hmm. How many clients you lost because of private pay? Yeah. I mean, I think it is hard to tell, um, really specifically, and I didn't have all of my clinicians, um, put reasons for why each month we keep track of lots of numbers, one of which is um, termination sessions, right? So the last session with anybody, right? Sometimes we call it a graduation, mm -hmm. um, probably based on how they're feeling at the end of treatment. Um, <laughs> but then there were plenty of clients who said, like, February 28th is going to have to be my last session because of the switch Um come March 1st. So mm -hmm. I don't have like all the fine tuned details of uh, what that is. But obviously, with that number, it's very clear that we had clients that decided that they could no longer um, be seen at Thrive. Mm -hmm. um, we also did um, create a list of practitioners in the area found on, psychol on psychology today that are in network with Blue Cross so that we could hand people off and really try to do the very best we could with client care and continuity of care. Um, but there were a lot of people too that for some, they'd been coming to therapy for a while and they were still just kind of coming because it's what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and so for those people, it was probably a combination of the fact that we're changing and it was kind of like maybe a motivator to like try yeah not going to therapy for a while and see how they do. Mm -hmm. um, I do sometimes tell clients, my job is to work myself out of a job in many ways. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so yeah, there's just a lot of layers to, to those numbers. But I think that certainly February, we had a lot of um, nerves about clients leaving. Yeah. Um, and I did even have to tell my, um, my, clinicians, I lost people too. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it didn't feel good. In fact, I was thinking, you know, in this business, right? Like we have boundaries and we don't cross them and things like that, but it can be hard to lose clients even when they get a new job and they have to move out of state, you know, and it's like, Oh, I like, I, you know, like we were doing really good work or they were, you know, really it's like the client was doing such good work and it was so fun. Um, and 
fulfilling to be on that journey with them. And so then like for it to end, what maybe feels like prematurely can, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you can have some, some feelings because therapists are human too, and we get to be human. And so um, some of that I think was hard too, because sometimes it felt like the therapeutic relationship was ending prematurely. Um, And so we just did our very best to make sure that everybody felt like they had kind of a handhold if they couldn't, uh, if they couldn't remain getting yeah. treatment here at Thrive. Yeah. Yeah. The other number, um, you know, for context, how many new intakes per month are you getting compared to what it was before? So in 2021, we were averaging almost 70 new appointment requests a month. That's what I call an intake, new appointment requests, almost 70 in 2021. And uh, in March and April this year, we did see a l- we saw a dip. Uh, so in March, we had 46 new appointment requests. And then in April, we're getting close to the end of April. Uh, we are at 26 new appointment requests. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's those are some of the numbers that I track as the one who looks at the marketing side of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but maybe we need to talk about like how many new clients did you gain? So uh, in average, in 2021, we averaged 24 new client appointments. So people who actually booked 24 clients per month. That seems like a lot. Is that right? <laughs> 24. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you keep a lot of those numbers. I, yeah. I believe that it is. Yeah. Um, you know, I, as you were reading those numbers, I was just thinking that the amount of time that I was spending towards the tail end of last year dealing with the ton of uh, insurance related work in addition to preparing for this transition, um, I, I didn't create a ton of content. I didn't, you know, I mean, I think that you, you definitely have to keep the momentum going. Mm -hmm. And if I had only one thing to do over, of course, it's easy to pull apart any big transition and be like, Oh, I do this differently and do that Mm -hmm. differently. But I really would have ahead of time prepped some content, some other things. um, Because I, I really do think that some of those numbers are a reflection of the fact that our website is clear that we're not in network anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're not being found, hopefully, on Blue, Cl- Blue Cross's uh, provider list. Mm-hmm. But I really think that what we're in need of right now is to build that momentum back up by putting uh, more content out there for clients and um, and in many ways, too, it provides a resource for clients who um, feel like they can't be coming in weekly, things like that. So yeah. Yeah. Um, if I had it to do over, I would do that. And I do think that um, the numbers may sort of pair up with the fact that like this past six months has been so busy with worthwhile tasks, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but now I have definitely found that w- even just two months in, my time feels so much more freed up mm. so that I'm now thinking about creating content. That's right. That's interesting. So as you just even for your current clients, just people who are, you know, on your mailing list or people who down, download your lead PDF, that as you're going through that transition and letting people know you are showing up in their inbox, showing, giving them quality content and helping them solve problems even through that. So that's a really interesting idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we live and learn that one. Uh, yeah. So how many clients? So we were talking about how many intakes per month we were getting and how many new clients did you gain? So in March of this year, uh, we gained 18 new clients, which is pretty strong. And those are private pay clients, 18 new ones. Yeah, that's uh, not that far off from our average of 21, right? At 20, 24. Or 24. Yeah, no. And yeah. it's like a higher reimbursement. So it it could be easily a net gain on that. Um, yeah. And then in, in so far in April, uh, we're getting towards the end, but you've had 15 new clients. So the ones that, you know, the ones that you would lose, let's just say you probably got back and at a higher rate. I mean, and we're not just talking higher rates. I'm talking like, we're talking like solid rate, rookies, which we might re- talk about in just a minute. So, you know, the, our average in 2021, our average, um, price per appointment that we got was 
$128.55. That's the average over all of them. That was in 2021. In January of this year, we were looking at $100 on an average. In February, it was just a little over $100. March, we had a really interesting blip. <laughs> but in March, we averaged $199.55 per appointment. Uh, but that was because there was a kind of a big insurance, I think, payment that came through. Um, but now in April... We're looking at $145.62. Uh, and that's kind of a rough number, what we we're able to get to, but $145.62 uh, per appointment. And that is um, that is what we're almost $20 more per appointment. And if you have hundreds of appointments, that's real money uh, for both the clinician and for the practice. Uh, but that's also not even reflecting the new rates uh, that we're looking to have, especially your new rates. You gave yourself a wonderful raise, which I'm so proud, proud of you doing. Mm -hmm. um, and you also gave your clinicians a raise as well. And mm -hmm. people, as we can see, all these new appointments, they're still, people are still booking. So I'm curious, if you want, you can kind of share the range of, because I, I, I know people are going to ask and want to know, what is kind of the range of your, your private pay prices now? Sure. So, um, for our standard sessions, the range is about 145 to 195 uh, a session in our uh, assessment sessions, or sometimes people call them intake sessions, um, which charge a slightly higher rate than that. Um, I think the highest it goes up to like 235. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely based uh, comparing that with what the insurance companies reimburse. <laughs> um, there's a bit, there's a bit of a jump. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention that I looked over the last, um, well, just sort of like the end of 21 and the beginning of 22, I was trying to see what the average amount of sessions, um, like if they happened in November, how many of them were actually paid in November, right? Like, because there's mm -hmm. such a lag time with insurance. Um, and I know somewhat recently there was a huge gap in payments from some of the major insurance companies, or maybe at least just one. Um, but that, you know, they get computer issues and all sorts of stuff. I know at the beginning of last year or something, there was another, right? January is kind of weird and they try mm -hmm. to hurry and process a bunch of stuff in December. But it looks like, um, the number of appointments that insurance pays the same month that the appointment happened is somewhere between like 55 and 65%. So even though like month after month, right, you're kind of playing catch up um, and maybe filling in that other 50% with last month's 50% or what have you. Um, there's definitely that lag. And already my team has said to me that it's really nice to know, like if I run that card before, you know, the middle of the day on the last day of the month, I'm getting paid for that in my next paycheck. Mm -hmm. And they can kind of um, total it up a little bit easier. They have a better idea of what they're going to be making on average because the fees are a lot more similar. Um, mm -hmm. and there's not that lag. So March was kind of beautiful in that we had the spillover of some insurance payments from February, plus all of the in real time, I guess you could say payments from services provided during March. Mm -hmm. Um, so April's a little different because we haven't had I don't know that we've had any insurance payments. Yeah, I have a note here, zero ones. insurance reimbursements or payments yeah. for the practice. Yeah. So how, yeah. how is that feeling? Because that's going to be kind of the real, you know, moving forward. I mean, you're not out of business, right? I mean, it's like. Oh, gosh, no. No, we're, <laughs> the, the lights are staying on and so are the sound machines. <laughs> we're good. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's different for each of my clinicians and, and even for myself to see um, what like adding a new client does, we tried with our um, established clients. So clients that began services before the end of 2021 to not um, raise their rates to our new client level 
to not like totally make everybody panic. Um, right. And so we, we kind of worked with all of that. Um, so as you add new clients, um, at your true, like sort of new rate, that, um, really does have a pretty significant impact. Um, I think overall the numbers for the practice are a little lower than we have seen. Um, but, I think that each of my clinicians has had a new client every week and, um, you know, or two in one week and then none in the next week, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so while it is going to take a minute to kind of build back in, um, they're, they're making comparable income to what they had been. Um, and a lot of, a lot of them are saying like, I'm having time to read books now and do some of the, (laughs) you know, learning, because we have talked a bit about, um, you know, doing really good work, because the clients that are coming in to see us are going to expect that of the, of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's actually kind of been a nice balance to, um, you know, sort of help them open up some of their schedules so that they can read and learn and mm-hmm. really think about what they want to do with their clients when they come in. Yeah, because if the private pay mindset is is I'm I'm this economic exchange. I I'm expecting value because yeah, and and so now the clinicians are like, okay, like I think you have great clinicians, but they're like, we actually need to for ourselves, we need to level up our own game, and that's only going to just benefit your brand. So here, and just kind of conclusion notes here, I think why this worked, and I'm saying it's going to work, even though the numbers are preliminary. Um, you're still making the practice is making good money. It really mm-hmm. is. It's doing a great job. Um, I think you have a strong brand because you niche down and you focused on solving just a couple unique problems to couples and marriages. Um, so you've had three plus years in the community known for doing good work, good work. Um, I think your website does a lot of the selling for you. You have a lot of great content. It's clear up there. So when people find you on Google, they have a great experience. Um, and I think the other thing that why this worked really well is that you you communicated so well to your current clients and you worked really well with your team to get them all on the same because it is a massive mind shift for clients and for your team. And so you are having to hold all of that. And yeah. for, for most, cl- <laughs> you're like, yeah, no, I mean, for most pe- for most clinicians, it's just themselves, right? A lot of soul sure. practices is, but you did this for a group practice. Mm-hmm. So you worked really hard to make sure that transition went really well. And so yeah. that was very impressive. And the fact that you have all these numbers that we could share, um, is also really impressive too. I think you're a really f- fantastic operator, uh, of, of a practice. So but thanks for coming on and sharing all of this. If, if, and I'm sure lots of people have questions. If they do, how can they reach out to you and get in contact with you? Yeah, I would love to answer anybody's questions. I feel like this doesn't all need to be a mystery and we don't all need to like squirrel away our information. Um, I, you know, there's plenty of work to go around and all of that kind of thing. So I would be happy to, yeah, share, share any more that I learn. And certainly as time goes on, there will be more and more numbers to, to look at. Um, but if anybody wanted to get a hold of me, uh, email is probably best. Uh, you can find me at Megan, M E G A N at thrive couples counseling.com. There you go. And if you want go to thrive couples counseling.com. And if you click on the payment for services, you could see Megan's smiley face on <laughs> a, a private pay a video that we created. So, um, all right. Well, that is it. Thank you for joining me on the private, on the private, on the brand your practice podcast. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe to it, share it with a fellow mental health professional, and we'll see you next time on the brand your practice podcast.